in Asia. This is the last full moon of the rainy season, and it marks two events, at least here at the monastery. One is the day in celebration of Nagas, the Nagas who reported to protect the religion. And John Lee would have a ceremony every year at the state, preparing the, the Naga food and thinking of the Nagas, showing appreciation for the protection they've given us. It's also the night on which the Buddha delivered the Anapanasati Sutta, setting out the sixteen steps, ensuring the relationship to the four establishings of mindfulness, the seven factors for awakening and clear knowing and release. So the best way to celebrate that is to practice breath meditation, as we're doing right now. But the two events connect with the seven factors for awakening, because the Nagas are supposed to have seven heads, and they represent those factors for awakening. So how are those factors related to the breath? Well, it depends on how you approach the breath. To begin with, you're mindful of the breath. You keep it in mind. This is where you want to stay. And you're mindful of all the things you've learned about dealing with the breath. And you try to bring them to bear so you can recognize when something comes up. If it's a thought that's related to the breath, you want to encourage it. If it's one that's not related to the breath, you want to let it go. As, those, as for those that are related to the breath, that's where we come into the second factor for awakening, which is analysis of qualities. You want the breath to engage your imagination. It's not a dry analysis, well, this is good and this, that's bad. But you want to think about how the breath has an impact on your health, the health of the body, the health of the mind. And it's your direct experience of the body. In fact, it's so direct that we tend to overlook it. And John Fuhrman called it the, the grass at the gate of the corral. The cows are kept in the corral, and when the gate is open, they go running out to find grass out in the meadow. And they neglect to see that there's grass right there at the post next to the gate. The breath is so close that we don't see it. Our focus is further out. So we're going to bring our focus back in and get ourselves acquainted with this breath energy in the body. Where does it flow? How does it flow? How do you promote it? I know some people who push it around a lot. When they're pushing it around, they're not pushing the breath, they're pushing the blood and the lymph. And that can create a lot of tension in different parts of the body, especially if it gets stuck up in the head. You've got to remind yourself, breath flows through everything. What runs up against pressure is the, is the liquid element. The breath element doesn't have pressure. It flows, flows, flows. And it's all around you. Remind yourself that your awareness is not focused ahead of you. We tend to think that way because our eyes are focused ahead of us. But when we close our eyes, we can remind ourselves that our awareness of the body is all around. So think of the breath bathing you, or that you're wearing the breath. Now, as you think in these ways, you realize you're working both with the breath and with the perceptions around the breath. And that's what analysis of qualities is all about. Getting to know your mind as you engage it in something interesting. There are people who used to criticize it, John Lee, saying, how can you teach people the breath? What is there to gain insight with? It's just in and out, in and out. And his response was, well, if that's all you see, then that's all there is. The implication being is that if you look more carefully, you see there's a lot here. The way mental events interact with physical events, it's right here, the breath, with those perceptions that you have of the breath. So as you take an inquisitive attitude towards the breath and the mind's relationship to the breath, and you both of them as they relate to the present moment, 
and as they relate to the process of fabrication going on in the body and the mind. You're bringing your discernment to bear. And that discernment is what's going to give you your insights. But for the insights to get solid, you have to develop further. It's first to give rise to a state of concentration. You can say that the seven factors of awakening describe how you go from right mindfulness to right concentration through discernment. Because the next step is basically right effort. Once you see what's skillful and what's not skillful, you focus on what you can do to give rise to what's skillful and let go of what's not. Keeping in mind that this is what you want to train the mind in so that it's, it's attitude all the time. As this life goes on, illness comes, aging comes, death is going to come. And you still want to engage in right effort, even as you're dying. So think about that. If you're having difficulties right now, think how, how difficult it's going to be then. And you have to develop the right attitude. On the one hand, you have to accept the things that you cannot change. But you also have to have an attitude of defiance, that whatever opportunity you have to not suffer, you're going to take it. This is why we look into the qualities of the mind. As we get older, the strength of the body goes down. But the mind doesn't have to be that way. But there's a strong temptation as the body weakens, the mind weakens as well. And you want to fight that temptation. This is why I said defiance is the attitude. We hear so much about acceptance, 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 and there are things you do have to accept. But you often have to accept the mind's potential to not suffer. And that requires that you be defiant. So you're going to develop your strengths in spite of the weakness in the body, in spite of the difficulties that the body might give you. And as you're dealing with the breath, you find that there are ways in which you can breathe that create a lot of discomfort in the body. And if you're engaged in that kind of breathing, you don't just sit there and continue with it. You figure out what's wrong, what needs to be changed. And if you can't figure anything out, just allow the breath to come in and go out for a while and watch it without any interference on your part. If the body's going to breathe, it's going to breathe on its own. And see what it does, because sometimes you have some preconceived notions about the breath that you've been applying, and they're the problem, but you don't see them. So the best way to see them is to tell yourself, okay, no interference, no engagement with the breath at all. You watch the breath, but you're not going to do anything to change it. And see how the body breathes. And then you may catch sight of something you didn't see before. Then you can make use of that. So right effort is a combination of acceptance and defiance, a combination that we have to keep going, we have to cultivate now, so that we can maintain it as things get even more difficult outside, inside the body. And when we can do that, then there's going to be a strong sense of energy. The Pali word bitti can mean rapture, refreshment, energy. For some people it's very strong, for other people it's not so strong. And John Lee talks about a sense of fullness in the body, that the breath energy seems full. Not that you're pumping up air into the lungs so much, but you get a sense of when the nerves in the body feel depleted and when they feel full of energy. Again, it's not a frenetic energy, it's just a nice, solid energy. John Lee calls it a, a solid energy. And how do you breathe? It gives rise to that. How do you think of the breath in a way that gives rise to that? When your efforts are right, there will be that sense of energy. And then when you've had enough of that energy, things will then grow calm. That's the next factor for awakening. And then in the concentration, in the 
steps of breath meditation, they talk about being sensitive to the mind, then gladdening the mind. This is where you energize things. And then concentrating the mind. In the descriptions of jhana, they say first that you have a sense of ease and refreshment. First based on seclusion, the fact that you're simply not thinking about things that would have a bad impact on your breath energy, bad impact on your sense of the body right now. And there's a sense of ease that comes that way. But then as the mind begins to settle in and becomes more and more one with the breath, then you move from calm to concentration. This is where things begin to seem really strong and solid inside. And so you maintain that balanced focus. Because at this point you're no longer engaged so much in the direct and thought and evaluation that are involved in analysis of qualities. And you're just there with the object, one with the object. And then from there it gets to the point where the breath grows very still. The rapture is gone. Even the sense of ease. It's there, but it's so subtle that it's more like equanimity. Everything is very, very still. And you learn how to maintain that stillness with a sense of balance. And that's how dealing with the breath relates to the seven factors for awakening. But then they, in turn, relate to clear knowing and release. In other words, you have to practice them in such a way that they are based on seclusion, in other words, based on getting the mind in concentration. And then you develop them in such a way as to give rise to dispassion, cessation, and letting go. What that means is you look at your hindrances, any distractions, in a way that gives rise to dispassion. And you realize that the hindrances are not something barging in from outside. You are actively working in, in fabricating them. Why are you expending energy in that way? As long as you find them interesting, as long as they happen to lure, you'll keep on doing it. But when you see how they arise, how artificial the whole thing is, and how to keep them from passing away, you have to keep them going. You begin to see, well, what's the allure? Why do you go over these things? And the best way to know the allure is to get the mind not to go for them. In other words, order it and see how it complains. My little bit of this shouldn't be too bad, a little bit of that shouldn't be too bad. And you've got to be firm, no, no, no. Because you see, the, the little bit of this or that can eat away at your concentration. They're not innocent little pleasures. They take their toll. When you can realize the drawbacks, that's when you develop this as passion. And it's because you were fabricating them to begin with, when you are dispassionate toward them, they cease. And then you just let go of the whole problem. That's when you're dealing with distractions. Ultimately, you turn that same analysis onto your own concentration. When things are solidly established, and you get better and better at the concentration, you begin to see, okay, this too is fabricated. It has its drawbacks. And there comes a point where you get exasperated with the fabrication. Why can't there just be stillness without your having to keep on maintaining it, maintaining it, looking after it? So again, you look for the, the allure. Look at the drawbacks. Even your concentration has its drawbacks. The Buddha says this of all five of the, the faculties. They have their allure, but they also have their drawbacks. When you compare those, 
That's when there's dispassion, even for concentration, even for your discernment. You have to let go of that as well. It does its work, but then you put it down, like tools, making a chair, making a desk. As long as you still haven't finished it, you keep your tools in good shape. When the desk is finished, you don't go keeping your tools in your hands, because if you could mark up the desk at that point, you put them down. So that's how breath meditation leads to clear release, through going through the factors for awakening. So on this night when we think about the Nagas, think about the Buddha teaching breath meditation, think about them together. Try to bring all of these things together. When talking in terms of analyzing it, this factor and that factor, it seems to scatter things out. But remember, it all concentrates right here. When you're here with a sense of interest in what you're doing, all those factors come together. Especially interest motivated by the desire to do this well. And to do this in such a way as to give rise to a solid sense of well-being. And then getting more and more particular about what really counts as well-being. And you're not going to be willing to settle for second best. Remember the Buddhist teachings on contentment. You're content with your outside conditions, but you're not content with this level of skill in the mind, to say nothing of being content with unskillful factors. You work on the skillful ones and you might you don't keep at it. As John Fung used to say, you have to be crazy about the meditation in order to do it well. And it's that element of finding that it captures your imagination, and it captures your desire, it challenges you. What would you like to do this really, really well? When you have that attitude, everything comes together.